Natural Speech 3 is a model that produces speech from text. And obviously, this is the third one in the series of the natural speech um, models. Um, and these models get quite complex, like how, uh, like the architectures of how they're built. Obviously, it's going to be a diffusion model. Um, everything's a diffusion model or a transformer or, or both. And, um, yeah, it produces some pretty good speech. They, I think, do they open source it? I think they definitely don't open source the models, but they show some samples and I think they open source the code as well, which is quite nice. Um, because this model architecture is, uh, a little, little complicated or there's some details that are, that are quite weird, but it's cool to see some speech models that are coming out that are getting increasingly better and better. Um, speech is a weird domain, so it's cool to see that. So, like, to model speech, normally, you usually encode things as, like, a spectrogram, and you can do some sort of diffusion on that, but there's problems with that, and that uh, there's details that are going to be missing. There's a lot of details in audio. Like, you can't just, like, with, with text, you have one word, like the word the... Like this is this is easy to model. You can model this because you have a distribution of words. Um, with images, it's harder because you're in a continuous domain. And with speech, um, it seems to be even harder than than images, even though it's a one D domain. Uh, either that or there's less research, probably the latter. Uh, but it, it's hard to model because you have this unnormalized data. Like you have this frequency that can go on for whatever time you want it to be. And it has this unstructured mess of, uh, of data. And this unstructured mess is, is really hard to model, especially because it's, it's hard to like tokenize and to throw it through a transformer. Like with images, at least you have this structure. You know that it is in this you, you you basically know the dimension of the data you want to generate, and you know that each pixel is going to be of size, or is going to be in between zero and two fifty six, and you have RGB, or zero and two fifty five. Um, audio, on the other hand, can be unnormalized, and you get this mess. Um, converting it to a spectrogram kind of normalizes it, but you get this discrete representation with maybe something like that. Um, which represents the uh, frequencies in this, but this is also still hard to model. So anyways, uh, speech is hard to model, and um, that's why these models become so complex. So the idea in this model is to decompose the audio into multiple parts. Um, they show that here. Basically, the idea is to take some text. So obviously, this is going to be a text-to-speech model. And we're basically going to be modeling this in a in a latent space. So you have this encoder here, and you have this decoder. Um, we're going to be working in the latent space of this encoder, decoder. Everything's better in a latent space. It's compressed information, and it's a lot more rich in a latent space. Um, not doing it in a latent space is, is probably not a good idea. Um, it's a lot harder to work with raw data and a lot less computationally friendly. But the idea is you have text, and you're going to convert the text to phenomes. You're going to convert these phenomes to a duration, basically how long are you saying each phenome. Um, you then convert this to a porosity uh, and content and detail. So uh, like a phenome, you can think of this as like the most basic parts of speech. So if I have some text, like the most basic part of the word cat um, for text would be like the letters. But in audio, it's it's different. Uh, a phenome is different than just the raw text. So if I say the word cat, you hear the k, which is like a like a hard k sound. Um, this hard k also appears in kit. So the word cat and kit, the the word the the way I'm saying the letter k is the phenome. And you can think of you having a sequence of this rather than it being a sequence of tokens. It's a sequence of phenomes. So, um, yeah, and if you're curious more about that, go ahead and search it up. I don't know. That's just like basic uh, basic parts of speech rather than basic part of text. 
Um, duration is just how long are you saying the phenome for. Prosody is a ton of details in the audio, um, such as like the pitch and the stress for uh, the parts of audio. The content. This is going to also be the. This is going to be the uh, the phenomes as well. And the detail is just going to be extra detail. So we'll get to how this works later. But idea is we're going to encode some text, um, work in the latent space and decode it. And we're going to do that with a bunch of diffusion models. Now, one thing to mention is there's also this timber. Uh, I think that's how you say it. It's timber part here. I, I'm wrong. It's timber. This timbre uh, element here. And this timber element um, is going to be jet, is going to be used along with the porosity, the content, and acoustic detail. So timbre is basically the it's like the details of a speaker that make that speaker unique. So like you can have this text uh, be converted to audio, but the way I say a sentence is going to be different from the way someone else says a sentence. And the detail of the sentence that I'm saying is going to be the exact same as a detail as, or is going to be similar to the detail, like the meaning behind a sentence that somebody says is going to be similar to the meaning of the detail, or the meaning of the sentence that I say. Timbre is basically modeling the unique parts of the speaker that make it unique. So it doesn't change the details of the speech, it just changes how like basically the speaker um uniqueness for the speech so n n not the detail but the uniqueness of a speaker so timbre models like the speaker um this only works if you have a ton of speakers in your data set otherwise it's going to overfit so need a lot of speakers in your data set uh you'll see why because the way you model this is a classification task um and you use the raw features from that so let's go through this big uh, model here. So the model starts out with a waveform. Uh, I mentioned you sometimes work with, or you usually work with spectrograms, but um, they work with the waveform here, which is more difficult to work with. But um, I guess if you can uh, work with the waveform, then it's, it, it can do fine. I know Encodec works with the raw waveform, and Encodec works quite well. So. The way you model the waveform is you have this long 1D sequence here. And this 1D sequence is going to be some number of seconds, maybe four seconds, and each second is going to be, say, sampled at 16 kilohertz. And this is like this is just gonna be one long vector representing some number of seconds sa sampled at some rate. So some long vector. And you're just going to have a bunch of 1D convolutions, um, maybe also a recurrent neural network in there. I think they throw an RNN in there, basically modeling the this as a sequence rather than this as a, um, like this is a one, modeling it as a sequence rather than it's just a, a set of features. And this will output a set of features here, uh, which will be, so this is just of shape big D. Really, um, yeah, this will just be of shape big D, and this will be little d, and you're going to have some set of features, we'll call it F. So the input, one long vector, the output is going to be some set of features because you're using convolutions. So the convolutions are going to give you some set of features. Now, one thing to note is these features are still continuous um, because you haven't really done anything to discretize it. It's just... You're going from continuous data to continuous data. It's still a continuous, it's still in a continuous domain. And that means you can't just throw it through transformer. Uh, you have to discretize it first. Um, we'll get to that later, but um, assuming we can discretize it, uh, we can then throw it through a transformer. And we're going to be doing diffusion on this. And the diffusion we're going to be doing on this is actually not on continuous data, it's on discrete data. And the diffusion is going to be a discrete diffusion, which is kind of cool. I'll talk about how the discrete diffusion happens later, but just think of this part here as modeling. Um, it's, di it's diffusing the features out. Um, 
we'll get to how this latent is used later. They show it just going into all three of these. But imagine I have a diffusion model. Um, we'll go with this example for now. Imagine I have a diffusion model, uh, DM. Uh, DM. So the diffusion model is obviously going to take some set of data. So like a normal diffusion model. Um, all right, I'll draw it out over here, actually. Uh, so a normal diffusion model would take in some set of data, uh, some noisy data, and it'll output a um, basically the unnoisy, the the non-noisy version of that data. So in our case, we have um, let's say we want to model the porosity. So in our case, we have some set of features f, and we basically want a diffusion model to learn how to generate porosity, just generate porosity. So we have a diffusion model, and it generates the porosity. So we have some noise. We're going to call this, or we'll call this Z. Well, Z is just sampled from a normal distribution. Um, and this is going to give us some set of features. So diffusion model just takes in noise and gives us a set of features. And in this case, this will be the porosity. Now, this is an ambiguous task. So what we do? is we're going to condition on the input audio. And we're actually not going to condition on the input audio. We're going to condition on, I think, the content. Um, but basically, you're going to condition on the set of features here, the latent H. Um, in this example, like I said, I think it's going to, it's actually the content. Um, we'll see later. And this makes it uh, not ambiguous. And it, it'll generate the porosity for this sequence here or rather for the text that corresponds to that sequence. But um, basically, we have this porosity, and we wanted to model the porosity. Um, we also wanted to model the content and the acoustic detail. So we have these three diffusion models, and the diffusion models are going to learn how to generate these three features um, using the encoded version of the speech. Um, this is basically like a, a double encoder. So you have an encoder here, and then this encoder here will bring it down to the latent space that the diffusion model is going to be working on. But for now, just know that we have three diffusion models that are going to generate each of these, the acoustic detail, the content, and the porosity. Um, we then have a transformer that generates the timbre. Or timbre. Um, this model here is it, it generates a single token as the output. So this is a different type of model, but um, basically you have your transformer here. You have your set of features, and it's going to output a token here. And this token is going to be a continuous token representing the um, the speaker timbre or speaker timbre. I keep on pronouncing that wrong. And this is going to be used to condition. Um, your decoder here. So this is the idea. Basically, we have some, this is how we're training the thing. We have a raw waveform, we then encode it. And we encode this so, uh, such that we can get the, uh, or su such that it's in this latent space. We then send this through diffusion models, which are going to generate these three sets of features and a timbre extractor which is going to generate the speaker information. Um, using these details, we can then send it through the decoder, which gives us the, which gives us the generated speech. Uh, the decoder is also conditioned on the timbre. And this is just going to be a, another convolutional neural network. Um, they mentioned that this has more parameters than the encoder because the decoding task is more important. That's like, you don't, you don't care about the encoder. That's going to be thrown away. You just care about the decoder parts because we're not we're not going to be encoding anything. We want to generate audio, not encode it at all. But uh, I guess you can actually encode things with this, which may be useful. But anyway, the idea is that's that's the idea of the model. Now, there's a lot of stuff going on here. So the stuff here are a ton of losses. For now, I'll go over the losses here. Um, and then I'll go over the GRLs um, later. So the losses here uh, are 
So the prosody here, they just use this normalized F0. Um, this is like the fundamental, searching it up, it just, it's just the fundamental fre frequency, uh, sorry, frequency of speech. Um, this is basically like the, the base of, of your speech. So, um, yeah, if I don't know too much about speech, but if you do, this is the porosity. It's just the F zero frequency. So well, the, the most important frequency in your porosity generation. Um, the content is just going to be the phenomes of the generated audio here. And this here is going to be extra detail. This is detail that is not in the porosity and not in the content. And the timbre is a classification. So imagine we have a data set of, say, a thousand speakers. This is literally just a classification. And this classification here, this is going to be like some classifier, uh, some classifier, some like classifying, some classifying head. And we're going to use the latent here. Um, and you, if this head is quite small, if it's just a linear layer, then you would imagine the uh, hidden features here will have to be quite nice and will basically have to model the speaker in order for you to decode this in one linear layer. So assuming these features here represent the speaker, then you can decode, then you can decode it using that information. And this here will represent that because you're modeling this as a classification. So. Um, this is why you need a lot of speakers, because if you don't have a lot of speakers, it'll obviously overfit, and this information, like, the model will only learn how to generate audio in a few speakers. It won't learn how to generalize and um, generate audio in different types of speaker information, because this is continuous, so you can model this, uh, you can change this slightly, and it'll probably change the output slightly, because the speaker information will be different. So, these are the basic losses. Now, I mentioned that we want this to generate porosity, we want this to generate content, we want this to generate acoustic detail. Well, there's nothing, there's nothing making the model do that. Besides, like there's this classification here, or there's this loss here, just um, L, um, MSE loss, but there's nothing forcing this to just generate porosity and this to just generate the phenome. So what they, like, this can still represent some phenome information. It can kind of cheat, and this can still gener uh, generate some uh, prosody information. Uh, it can also kind of cheat. So they add these GRL penalties, which come from a different paper. And the idea is for prosody, we add this penalty. And the penalty is basically going to add, it's, it's like a classifier attack. It's a, it's an adversarial attack, essentially. And the adversarial attack is forcing the gradient signal from here to not model the phenome information. So it's not going to model the content. Uh, here it's forcing it to not model the porosity content. And here it's forcing it to not model the porosity and content. So, uh, you can think of this as everything that's not porosity and everything that's not content. Um, additionally, we have this speaker part here, which is basically saying all the prosody content and acoustic detail should be unique of the speaker. Like I said, this, um, these details here, like it doesn't really, like these details don't depend on the speaker at all. We don't want them to depend on the speaker. We want to be able to change the speaker freely while keeping these details here, um, the same. And that's because these details like if you change the speaker, the details won't don't change. There is no in, they should be independent. There is no dependence. So the way they do that is um well, there's two parts to it. There's the first part, which is the speaker part, and there's the second part, which are these two features here. Um these features here are Continuous, these, this is just a classification. So for the classification, the idea, um, and they actually, in this paper, they model it, the details as, I think, rhythm, pitch, and content, 
but it's the same thing um, as we were doing before with porosity and content. Um, just three features instead of um, instead of two. So um, yeah, rhythm pitching content. So in this case, uh, the first case, we want to remove the speaker, the timbre information from all the other features. And this is um, this is a classification task. And to do that, they have this function here. And this function measures the dependence of feature X on feature Y. And the idea is, um, the idea is you just want to minimize that. You just want to minimize the dependence. So if we have this here, this function here, this models, this basically is a function modeling the dependence of the feature data, uh, rhythm pitching content in this case, on the timbre data. Um, and ZT is just the, Z is just the features. So it's basically, this here is modeling the dependence of the, the details on the timbre, the details on the speaker information. We basically just want to minimize that. Um, now, whenever we're actually doing the modeling, we're going to have a bunch of speakers. So let's define U to be some speaker, some speaker from the data set. So what we can do is we can basically train a classifier to, or we can basically add this gradient signal, which maximizes the dependence of the timbre on the speaker, because we basically want the timbre to model the speaker. That's exactly what we want it to do. So we just have a classifier here maximizing that. And that's that right there. We then add a second classifier um, minimizing the uh, dependence of the details on the speaker. So we have a classifier here maximizing the dependence of the timbre on the speaker. Here, we're going to have a classifier basically doing the opposite. Um, we want it to classify, uh, we will be basically want it to minimize the dependence of all this on the speaker. Uh, and you just do that with another classifier. Uh, yeah, and then they have these weird formulas here, which I'm not a really big fan of, but that's the idea. You basically want to make this, uh, make the details not dependent on, de depend, dependent on the speaker information. And you do that via this adversarial attack. Um, the idea for the continuous data is the same, except you model correlation. So this function here models correlation of X on Y. And you do this with just classifiers. So this is the probability of Y I given X I and the probability or log prob of y, j given x, i. So this is basically just modeling the correlation of the two features. And intuitively, um, we can just minimize the correlations here. So you just minimize the correlation. Uh, and that's it. You just use classifiers to minimize these. So that's the idea. This is just the, this is it written down over here. You basically have this one minimizing the correlation between prosody and content, and it's adding this uh, gradient penalty. It's or it's adding this gradient information here. So uh, eventually, if that penalty is kept there, this will only model the prosody, or at least if it models that function. If the um, GRL penalty is doing what it should be, um, and it's modeling that enough, then it'll eventually learn how to only model porosity or mostly only model porosity and no content if this penalty is high enough. Um, same over here. And if you add both penalties um, on this information here, then this will just model the detail information that isn't the porosity and isn't the content. Okay, that is gradient reversal. Now, um, let's talk about the diffusion models. So first off, the diffusion models are kind of look like this over here. Basically, you have some continuous information, and you're going to throw this continuous information through an encoder. 
And this continuous information is then going to be also continuous information. And you then do this vector quantization on it. And what vector quantization does is it turns these continuous vectors into discrete vectors. And using these discrete vectors, you can then do a classification task instead of a regression task. And um, you can then basically combine these vectors together to get out a similar vector to the one that was in the input because it's discrete now, so it's not going to be exact. You lose information when you make things discrete. And they mention this because intuitively, if we have a latent H representing the entire audio, the porosity is going to, it's not going to be, like you don't need all the information. This is, a, let's say this is 100% of the information. The porosity needs some subset of that. Maybe it just needs like 50% of the latent information. So intuitively, you should be able to compress the space it's working in which should force it to, forcing it to work in this smaller space should force it to force or force this bottleneck to squeeze out the information it doesn't need and to kind of help it and to kind of force it to only model this porosity content as opposed to modeling all the content. Um, cause if this was not a bottleneck, then it could just pass this through and it could be quite easy to model that. Um, and it can kind of cheat. So we discretize this. Also, discretizing things makes it easier to model than making it a regression task. So discretizing, very nice. Lose some information to force it to stop cheating and make it a classification instead of a regression task. Now, we do the diffusion on these tokens here. So this is a discrete diffusion model. This is not a continuous diffusion model. Um, you can then add these together uh, once you do your diffusion and you get out your continuous-ish um, output. Uh, it's not really continuous, but it models the continuous um, data because you're adding discrete factors. Um, and that'll be your output. So we have three of these diffusion models. We actually have four. We have one modeling the duration as well. Uh, now, real quick, going over residual vector quantization, in case you're unsure. Imagine I have a vector 1, 2, 3. Now, this vector, I'll just call this x. Um, I'm going to do it over here. So, system, you want whatever, stupid tablet. So, imagine you have this vector, x is equal to 1, 2, and 3. Now, what we can do is, this is going to be in our continuous space. This is in R3, despite them being integers. Now, what we can do is we can quantize this using, let's say we're going to use two codebooks, and we're going to use codebook sizes of four. So we can model this using two codebooks. Now, the first codebook, let's say it has the feature 0, uh, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 1, 0. So our codebook has four entries. Um, and this will be, say, codebook 1. Now, what we do is we look for the vector closest to the vector we currently have. And if you look at this, it's just that one there. So our code, or our, our, we can basically subtract this vector here from this vector and get out a new feature. So let's call this x hat is equal to x minus codebook 1 of 3. So if this is 0, 1, 2, and 3 three, and we pick this one, then we model, the, then we subtract it, and we get um, a new vector. So if we do 1, 2, 3, minus 1, 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, minus 1, 1, 0, then we get out a new vector, which is just 0, 1, 3. Now our second codebook, um, this is our first codebook, our second codebook Maybe it has the features 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 2, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, 1. So the closest vector here would be this one, and we just subtract it again. 1, 2, and 3. So we subtract it from this vector, and we get maybe x bar is equal to x hat minus codebook 2 of 1. So this is codebook 2. And this will give us 0, 0, 1. And this will be our residual here. So 
This is our this is residual vector quantization with two codebooks. Now, this gives us a discrete vector, which can be represented as, in this case, it was vector 3. In this case, it was vector 1. So 3 and 1. This is our discrete vector, and this here is our continuous vector. Because this is in um, codebook 1 by codebook 2. Now we can go back to the continuous domain by adding the um, features we have here. So if we take, um, so maybe we'll do x bar hat. There we go. There's our, we'll, do, we'll call x prime. Um, this is equal to codebook one of three plus codebook two of one. So this is going to be equal to one, one, zero plus zero, one, two, which is one, two, two. Uh, which is our reconstruction of the original value x here. So this here will be our input. Um, that'll be the input into the vector quantization. And this will be the output of the vector quantization. And this here will be our um, reconstruction that will be sent through the decoder. Now, what we can do to model this as a diffusion model is, since we're throwing this through transformers, you can basically have a unique encoding representing the integer or the integer representations here. And this gives you a vector sequence here. So, um, yeah, this basically gives you your vector sequence, which you can throw through a transformer and or output your, your vector sequence. Um, so let's talk about, uh, modeling this as a transformer now that we have vector quantization. So like I said, all every uh, all the modeling is going to be done on the vectors that are outputted by the quantization. So it's going to be done on here. So um, let's go to that. Uh, where do they have that? They have it here. So what we do is we have this mask here. So what our diffusion model is going, basically what diffusion models model is they model a, they model noise to data. And in this case, the noise is going to be a process that slowly, add, slowly corrupts the data by masking it instead of um, like adding Gaussian noise. So imagine we have a vector sequence. This will, this represents our image and discrete, or not image, I'm used to saying image with diffusion models. This represents our audio in discretized form. Um, each of these represents an integer representing the, like the integer we had up here. So if we have this integer here, three, one, this would be like the vector representing three, vector representing one, um, maybe we have another one, two, um, so on, more, more vectors. So we have the, this vector sequence here. Now what we do is we have this forward process, um, which is slowly going to corrupt the vector sequence. I'll just show this one up here. So this is three, one, and two. Um, the forward process, you know, usually adds noise to an image. In this case, it's going to randomly mask these vectors. So it's going to be a sudden masking and it's going to be a strictly increasing, um, function. So or it's just going to be an increasing function that should end with everything being masked. So the input sequence has nothing masked. Um, let's say we take one step. In one step, the first vector, say, gets masked. And they sample this using a Bernoulli distribution. Um, for those of you who are curious with how they do this. Um, but at each step, they basically sample this and they randomly mask these um, vectors here. So maybe this is time step equal to zero, time step equal to 0 0.25, uh, time step equal to 0 0.5, and 0 0.75, and this will be t is equal to one. So here we mask one token, here it doesn't mask any tokens, here it masks an extra token down here, and then here it finally masks this last token here. Now what we need to do is we need to train a model to reverse this. Now we can't just do this with a diffusion model. Uh, a diffusion model doesn't work that way. Like a diffusion model inherently takes noise, 
or it takes an image and it learns how to remove the noise from it by predicting the noise. But you can't give it mask tokens and generate a um, unmasked tokens. That that just doesn't make any sense in this context. So what we're going to do is we're going to train a model here, which is just going to predict the probabilities of the tokens. So what we do is we have our diffusion model uh, here, no, not B, D, DM, which is going to take our tokens here. And let's say token, I'm going to call this 0, 1, and 2. Let's say token 1 is masked and the rest are not. These are some terrible, these are the worst rectangles I've ever drawn. Oh my god. Um, anyway, the first token here is not masked, the second token is, and the third token is not. Basically, we're going to tr train the model in similar to BERT to predict the token that this should be. Let's say we have a code book with, say, k is equal to 1024 entries. This is our vocabulary. And you basically say, uh, you basically mask this, so it'll be 1024 plus 1. Uh, this here will be the 1024th entry, will be the last entry. It'll just be a, a mask token. You send this through, and the model needs to predict what the, uh, what the unmasked token is going to be. And this here will generate your distribution. So like a language model like BERT, it'll generate a distribution over your entire vocabulary, and you train it to predict what the actual token is. So this is just the negative log likelihood, and you train it to predict whatever that token is. So maybe it's the word, um, you know, yeah, cat. Then if this is the, not the word cat, but maybe it's like the phenome, um, like the, the one I said earlier for c and cat then it needs to generate that part, except this is latent, but whatever. It'll, it's going to be some part of the codebook that's going to generate. So maybe it needs to generate um, token 5 from codebook 1. So that's what you're training it to do. Instead of training it um, to produce, to uncorrupt an image, you're training it to uncorrupt mask tokens by predicting what those mask tokens should be. Um, now, if you do this for various maskings, um, including the entire masking, so if we do this for masking the entire sequence and only masking part of the sequence, then you get this diffusion process here, where you can basically say, I'm going to mask all the tokens here. So this is going to be your completely noisy process. And if you condition on something, um, then this becomes an unambiguous task. And the model can then output, maybe this is, say, codebook 1 of 6. And this is codebook 1 of 5, and this is codebook 1 of 700. We can then have the model take these mask tokens and generate the um, tokens that it should represent in the codebook. And then we can decode these um, to get the... Uh, output feature or output details that this model was trying to do. Now, this is a one-step procedure. What we can do instead of just saying, okay, model, give me the things in one step, because this is a diffusion model, we can say, um, like since this is a classification procedure, we know that this has a confidence of, say, 0 0.9. Um, I say confidence. Whatever the probability, the highest probability is, we can look at them. Maybe this is 0 0.9, this is 0 0.2, and this is 0 0.1. We say, oh, this is a pretty high probability, but these probabilities are, are really low. So what we can do is every part in this denoising process, um, we can take the top, say, k vectors. So maybe we have k is equal to 2 in this case, uh, 2. We can say, okay, I see you were pretty confident with this here. And fairly confident. Well, wasn't fairly confident. I'll change this to 0.8 to make it a better example. I see you are fairly confident in this prediction here, but you are not that confident in this prediction here. We then take these outputs and we throw them in back into the input. So this is no longer going to be a mask token. This is going to be codebook 6 and codebook 5. So codebook 6 and codebook book 5. And we keep this one masked here. We then throw this back through the diffusion model and it'll predict 
Um, these ones don't matter, but it'll re-predict this last token here. Maybe it's codebook 8. And maybe this is a probability of like 0 0.7 now because it has these other parts here. So um, yeah, and then we keep on doing that until we get our output sequence. So we um, basically train a model to predict uh, the real tokens from mass tokens. And you can do inference by giving it all mass tokens and slowly removing those mass tokens from what the diffusion model predicts. So this is the discrete diffusion model. And it's quite cool how they do this. Um, I do not know if they have a reference for this or if this is just um, something they created. Uh, not sure. You can also use CFG using the text prompt or using the text prompt, just like normal CFG. But um, and here's the loss. Basically, you just train you minimize the negative log likelihood for mask tokens. Um, yeah, so that is that. Now, last part about the diffusion models is they're not just dependent on themselves, they're dependent on each other. So, um, yeah, we initially take some text. So this is during, um, yeah, this is how you're going to train the diffusion model. So you train some text. And this is the text you want it to generate. So if I want something to speak, text to speech, you have text. You then have this phenome encoder. So instead of encoding the text, like I said, to tokens, um, you're going to encode it to phenomes, which are then going to be tokenized themselves. So it's not going to be tokens like the and then cat. It's going to be tokens like th and k for phenomes. Um, you then predict the durations for the phenomes. So this is just your first diffusion model. And what you do is you have these tokens here that you want to generate. These are your mass tokens, but you also give it the conditioned, the conditional information. And the conditional information in this case is going to be the phenome information here. And note that this is the input phenome information. This isn't like the phenome information we're going to generate. This is just the immediate phenome information. So we generate the durations and using the durations, we're then going to condition the prosody on the duration. So we have, oh, um, yeah, on the durations and the prosody prompt. I guess we also have the duration prompt um, here. My bad. We have the conditional information from the from the phenome information and from the duration prompt. You can imagine if I said um, generate me a like someone speaking for twelve seconds, then this would be like some token information saying twelve seconds. And maybe if I have some pros details, that would be added here, but. We condition the prosody on the length, on the duration, and also on the uh, prosody prompt, and this generates the prosody. And remember, this is going to be used in our decoder. We then condition the content, which is going to be our phenome information, on the prosody and on the content prompt, and we generate the content, the content latents. And finally, we have this detail, which is everything that's not the phenomes and everything that's not the um, prosody, and we get out our detail generation by conditioning on the phenomes and the detail prompt. And you you then add these together, you condition on the timbre, and you get out your decoded speech. So that's the pipeline. <laughs> this was a, a lot to go into this, but a bunch of diffusion models conditioned on each other using this discrete uh, diffusion modeling and timbre to get out your prediction. So this is this is the model. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they also mentioned that they drop out the detail um, because they don't want all the information going into detail. If you uh, look at how the loss is made, it could probably just throw a lot of the information in the detail and not have to worry about a lot of things and not have to worry about generating the prosody and content as much. Um, finally, I want to go through um, like the data set. Uh, I forget where they mention it. Uh, oh, they mention it right here. Uh, Liberty Light. So I think this is an open source data set, uh, which is quite nice. That means that uh, if you have thousands of GPUs, you too can make your own natural speech theory model. But it's nice that they're using open source data, um, not closed source data. Um, overall, it does really well on the benchmarks. Um, just uh, that are out there. 
Um, additionally, one other thing I want to show is that uh, this does the best um, for encoding speech data. Um, it, Encodec is the one I, I know of for encoding data in general. This model works best for encoding that, uh, for encoding speech data, it seems like, which is, which is nice. So if you want to encode speech data to some latents, you can use this model here. Um, an FA codec is specifically the encoder, decoder, and the, um, parts of the speech here. So yeah, overall, this model seems to do pretty well. Uh, it is quite cool seeing them, seeing all the engineering details that went into this paper. So yeah, that is Natural Speech 3.